Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Alison Lichter, and I am the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs here at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. <laughs> Hurrah! And on behalf of Dean Graciela Muszkowski and the whole day school community, I want to welcome you here and welcome you back um, for what will surely be a really inspiring and moving deeply felt event. Um, we're in for a conversation with two incredible journalists whose work dives into complex and often predatory systems that impact the most vulnerable families among us. And um, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague Jerry Hester in a moment, who will introduce our guests more deeply. Um, Jerry is a longtime member of the community here at the J School, starting with the program in its very first semester, directing its writing and reporting program. He then went on to become the founding editor-in-chief of the city and is back now here. <laughs> city? Uh, back now here at the at the J School as director of editorial projects and partnerships and interim director of our urban reporting program. So before Jerry takes over, I'm just going to give us our housekeeping rules, which are please silence your phones now. Um, and there will be a Q&A after the conversation. So we ask that you hold your questions until the Q&A. And please keep your questions concise and relevant. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Allison. And thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Uh, we're very blessed to have a lot of special events at the J School. This one is an extra level of special because we're welcoming Roxana back home. This is fantastic. <laughs> For those of you who may not know, Roxana is an alumna of our reporting, urban reporting program from the class of 2011. And I'm even prouder to say that her incredible book, We Were Once a Family, really represents an embodiment of this J School's mission. Roxana went beyond the headlines of a tragedy, investing years of in-depth reporting to deliver a powerful story that demands accountability and action. It's a story that she tells with unsparing honesty, clarity, and nuance. And it's a story driven by facts and above all by people. And yes, it's a heartbreaking story, but it's one that she's filled with humanity. And wherever there's humanity, there's hope. I can say the same for the work of our next guest, um, Andrea Elliott, who will be in conversation with Roxana this evening. Andrea toils down the block at the New York Times um, she's made it her mission in her career to document the lives of poor Americans, Muslim immigrants, and others on the margins of power. Um, Invisible Child, her incredible book stemming from her unforgettable series of stories about young Dasani Coates, earned last year's Pulitzer Prize in general nonfiction. Andrea is also the recipient of the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize, a George Polk Award, an Overseas Press Club Award, and was awarded the 2007 Pulitzer Prize for feature writing for her portrait of a Bay Ridge imam. We're thrilled that both of these great journalists are able to join us this evening. I know they have a lot to talk about, and I know they'll be able to, um, they'll be glad to tackle your questions in the latter part of our program. We also hope that you'll all be able to stick around afterwards to join us for some refreshments. And I'm happy to report that copies of both When We Were a Family and Invisible Child will be on sale outside, and that Roxana and Andrea will be happy to sign their respective books. So without further ado, let's turn it over to Andrea Elliott and Roxana Esgarian. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to start by saying that we did not plan this outfit. <laughs> just totally matching. Match. <laughs> it just is a testament to the fact that we are clearly kindred spirits, <laughs> that we're not only matching each other, but the chairs. <laughs> um, wow. Roxana, this book is a stunning feat of reportage. Um, it is both beautifully written and enraging to read. It's a book that takes hold of you and doesn't let go. 
Um, it'll keep you up at night. I recommend not reading it at night, as I made the mistake multiple nights of doing. It will rob you of your sleep. Um, and the, the way in which it takes hold of you and doesn't let go made me think, as I was reading it, that the people in this book and their stories must have done that to you as well, as you even began your reporting. And so I wondered if we could start there and if you could tell everyone in this room whatever you want to share about the journey of making this book, of reporting it, and what it's about. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it definitely kept me up at night. <laughs> um, so in 2018, just about five years ago, um, a family drove off a cliff in California, and it was two white women, uh, a married couple, and their six black adoptive kids. And um, I initially encountered the story as a reader, and it seemed almost like too terrible to even really think about. <laughs> um, a couple weeks after that, I got a call from another CUNY alum who was living in Portland. His name's Shane Dixon Cavanaugh. He's a reporter at the Oregonian. And so the, at that point, they had started kind of unraveling what was going on with the family. So initially, it seemed like it might have been an accident because it was on the Pacific Coast Highway, and people do crash and have accidents. Um, but this one, there were no break, there were no uh, signs of breaking, and then they sort of realized that they were involved in a CPS investigation just before they had crashed. So Shane called me because they had found out that one of the birth families, so there were six kids from two sibling groups, and one of the birth families lived in Houston where I was living at the time, and so I got an assignment to do like a door knock, you know, like a breaking news kind of thing, which I had done plenty of times in the past. But this time I felt really bowled over, like immediately from, well, first of all, the family was really welcoming and they let me, I think the Oregonian was assuming we were gonna get like a <laughs> quick quote. Um, but I spent two days with the family originally and it was clear that they were grieving not just this terrible murder, but the fact that they lost their kids at all. You write so movingly about that first encounter. Do you mind just telling the audience about, I remember, I think it was Sherry, who you watched get out of the car. I mean, you were put in a position that was kind of unique um, as a reporter, where you brought news to some of the members, at least, of the family. Yeah. Was that part of just what, what, what bowled you over? Maybe we could start there. Yeah. Um, I think... You know, most breaking news that I've done, I started as a breaking news reporter in, in the city here. And um, these big breaking news stories are often, there's a lot of reporters there. <laughs> so I think I kind of initially expected it to be like that because it was a big breaking news story. Um, but it was just me. And I think because it was just me, uh, the family was more willing to have like deeper conversations. Yeah. Um, and in those conversations, it was just so striking. Um, it was basically like they were being re-traumatized. So obviously, I mean, the worst possible thing that you could ever imagine happening to your kids, right, is like them being murdered. And You're a mom. Yeah, I'm a mom. <laughs> Um, and my mom, my son was one when I started reporting this. <laughs> so I was like a really a mom, like I was nursing. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it struck me very deeply talking to Sherry, who's the birth mom of three of the kids, that um, it was just losing them had never been reckoned with fully, and they were grieving that still as if it had just happened and that felt very immediate to them. Right. And that was so striking to me because the way that we were seeing 
the narrative start to develop was as if like these parents had just let them go like willingly and you know this was long gone for them but that wasn't the experience I had that's right you did have experience coming into this um, reporting on the child welfare system so you you knew you were familiar with uh, its flaws, and that shows in your in the way that you reported this out. You were um, wise to the system, in a sense. Can we talk a little bit just about more broadly speaking this system? Because, like you just said, I mean, one of the things that comes up again and again as you read this book, which is a book that I personally couldn't put down, is the inherent paradoxes of the story. The fact that the children were ostensibly saved, right, um, from harm by being removed um, from their black birth families only to be abused and ultimately murdered by their white adoptive mothers. And that the very narratives, as you put it just now, that were driving those removals, right, the view that these birth parents were unfit, that they didn't deserve their children, were utterly absent when considering the abuse allegations against the white mothers who were totally left off the hook like the system is. And there's this one passage that just drove me crazy on page 97, you know, where you write about how, you know, where the Davis family had encountered resistance in the system. Uh, the hearts, this is the white moms, were met with the benefit of, of doubt, you know, and so she, Priscilla's appeals rejected. She loses the kids who had been with her only five and a half months because they didn't get to six months. And yet the hearts who were on the receiving end are actually generated um, enough um, doubts among their neighbor neighbors to set off in uh, abuse investigations were still spared that kind of scrutiny. It's just like, it's like one outrageous paradox after the next. It just felt like, uh, like so could you talk a little bit about that? Like, what 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 is the the kind of um, the, the 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 clash that's that's at play here between these between these two sets of kinds of parents adoptive birth what are you showing in this book in terms of the system yeah I think um, a lot of the re the initial reporting was really focused on the women the heart women um, but through that we were learning that there were really alarming signs of abuse dating back a decade before this tragedy. So yeah, there was a question, and that question was sort of asked publicly, which was just sort of like, how could they have kept, how could they have been getting more and more chances, right? Um, they got really, there was three separate CPS investigations into the Heart Women, so that's, Mm -hmm. And none of them resulted in removal. Actually, maybe just for the benefit of the audience, can we just quickly review what happened to these kids in the custody of the heart moms? Sure. Yeah, so... They're removed from their birth families on neglect allegations. Yes, which not is... Not abuse. Big difference. Yeah, which is like the vast majority of um, families involved in CPS are are facing neglect allegations, which can often be confused with poverty because um, it's sort of the inability or um, of meeting kids' basic needs. Um, but with the Heart Women, the allegations were of withholding food. Um, there were bruises. Uh, one of the women, Sarah, she pled guilty to domestic abuse. Uh, for for hurting one of her kids. Um, and when before the second set of kids were adopted, they were already being investigated for abuse allegations of the first three kids. So there was a pretty alarming disparity there. That was one of the, mo the kind of central and immediate things that I noticed. Um, so the three Davis kids, which were the ones who lived in Houston, they ultimately were removed from their family. They were living with their aunt, and their aunt um, didn't have childcare. <laughs> she had moved into a bigger apartment in a public housing complex. She was a nurse. Yeah, right? she yeah she was a um, like a Church receptionist. Going. Yeah, <laughs> in a hospital, and she was a very 
uh, there was no criminal history and she was a very uh, nice woman and she um, she just didn't have childcare. <laughs> and also um, at the time, Texas wasn't even giving monthly payments to kinship placement. So she got like a one-time thousand dollar payment and a couple, you know, she got a couple grand essentially. In which, total, which is about what the hearts were getting every month. Yes, that's they, true. After these children from poor families. Yeah, that's that's very, and I think that's very notable because part of the issues resu were a result of that, right? Like, um, she needed to keep her job badly because she just had four more kids in her family all of a sudden, right? Um, and so she uh, needed to go to work, and her child she couldn't find childcare, and she asked the birth mom to babysit, and um, their mom was babysitting and a caseworker stopped by and removed the kids immediately. And that's that's how they were finally removed from their family. I, I really see this book um, as a corrective to a system that not just breaks apart families, but erases ties. And I think that's what's so powerful just as an act, this book. What, what it does is it says, I'm going to circumvent this narrative that is the giant global story of these, I mean, it was global news when these women drove off the cliff. Thelma and Louise, the two white moms, overwhelmed. It was a very sympathetic yeah. view. And I'm going to just try to get to the root of where these kids came from. Nobody was focused on that. And you did it. Um, I mean, <laughs> so I just want to I just want to applaud you for that because I think that just as a gesture, it's it's so important what you've done Thank you. in deciding to go in that direction. Um, I'm I'm curious, like, if you could talk about what you think is wrong, or what what could what what does the system need in order to to change? <sighs> <laughs> an abolitionist. <laughs> or, um, I, I, I think I would fall on the, I think I am an abolitionist. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> and let, let's talk about that. Like, what would you be abolishing? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, as you said, I, I had started writing and reporting on child welfare before I got this assignment. And I think if I hadn't, had that background, I might have approached the story differently or maybe not seen the the, the heart of the story. Um, but my first uh, big story about the child welfare system was about the federal lawsuit against Texas for the failures of um, its long-term foster care. So the kids who, um, and we haven't talked about Dante, but Three, there's three, the three Davis kids had an older brother named Dante and he was passed up for adoption. So he was in the foster care system for much of his childhood uh, in an institution and experiencing basically the worst of the worst of foster care. And so... Right, you talk about how RTCs, these residential treatment centers, and he was in one, um, I, th I can't remember, it was another stunning of many, many jaw-dropping moments in your book. Um, where you listed the number of abuse allegations and then the fact that none of them were investigated. It was just like, so So here you have children removed on neglect. This is one of the patterns and put in situations in which they do experience abuse at the hands of the state. Yes. And it's one. Yeah, and these kids who, particularly the older kids who aren't um, easy to place for adoption, they often end up in these treatment centers which are essentially institutions or maybe like modern day orphanages <laughs> that um, are staffed by people who are very poorly paid and um, aren't very well trained. And they're dealing with kids who have extreme amounts of trauma because they've been um, moved around a bunch and they usually have behavioral issues like Dante did. And, um, you know, I had learned about the failures of this part of the system before I met the Davis family. And two things. One was it was like, this was clearly, it felt clearly unjust. The What was being described to me felt unjust. Um, and the second thing is, 
I knew that Dante was, he was currently incarcerated when his siblings were killed, but um, I knew that I could, if, if he agreed that he has a whole foster care file that he could, um, that he's entitled to request. And that was the thing that broke the whole book open because it was 4,000 pages. <laughs> yeah. Must have been a huge turning point. Um, one of the most moving parts, though, of the book is when he's still incarcerated and he has yet to learn um, well, the, the fate of his siblings. Um, and, uh, and this is already major news, and yet he is from prison stating to, I think, his family that one of his major goals, as soon as he gets out, is to reunite with them. So again, you know, it comes up again and again how strong, of course, these bonds are. Yeah. And how they get treated by the system as if they, they don't even exist. Yeah. And I think Dante's story is such a very clear um, example of that because he's, he's, he was a kid you know, so the idea of foster care is that parents are being bad parents and they're putting their kids in danger and so we take the kids away, but where are we putting those kids, right? right. And the kids, um, you know, in Dante's foster care file, there's a little like paragraph every time he meets with his caseworker, so about once a month, and this went on for years, and every single time he met his caseworker, he asked, if he could contact his siblings and if they could have a home visit or a phone call or like you could see him sort of trying um, different things to, he, he took it so hard when he was removed from his siblings. He was the oldest and he felt responsible for them and he basically felt that they were removed from him because he was a bad person. That's how his 10 year old brain like right. made sense of that. And so that was just so brutal to read, if you can imagine. Yes. And also though, that is w what the system does is blames people. And you make this point again and again. And so he's kind of absorbing the message that is inherent in these removals that by, and you say this so well in the book, but by Focusing on personal responsibility, the system lets itself off the hook. Mm -hmm. So it's all on the parents until it comes to these women who are then seen in a very sympathetic way. And yeah. Well, and it's very interesting because you could see all of the ways that the caseworkers who were dealing with the adoptive moms kind of, it was, I, I like to think of it like they were legible to them, their parenting and their, the way that they talked about parenting. Um, you know, they talked about trauma and... Let's talk about this. Let's slow down. Because these women, uh, Jen, Jen in particular, is it fair to call her a con artist? That was the, That's what came to mind when I was reading. So she really puts out there on Facebook this, I mean, unabashedly white savior kind of persona yeah that is and it's and and there's so much lying going on but they're very very savvy and manipulating their yes. semi-public image at that point yeah and um like the uh so there were multiple investigations right but the when oregon opened their investigation into the women they called minnesota and the caseworker in minnesota said the problem is this is a quote these women look normal and they, whenever um, concerning behaviors get brought up to the women, they have a way of turning it around onto the kids themselves and their trauma histories as a reason why. Like, so they talked about their kids' food issues, for instance. And it's actually pretty common for people who have been in, kids who've been in foster care to have food issues because it's a, um, it's an attachment thing, right? Like they've been moved around a lot and they are um, they can fixate on food as like a survival thing. Like if I do, I have enough and am I okay? Um, but in this context, the kids were clearly not getting the, the nutrition that they needed. So the Oregon investigation found that five of the six kids were so small that they weren't even on the growth charts for their ages, which is really 
um, alarming. And the doctor said, well, we don't know their biological history, so they could all just be very small. <laughs> But the thing is, the kids came from two different sibling groups, so they're not biologically right. re related. And the fact that five of them were not were that small should have been an extreme warning that things were not right. But there was always sort of, um, it was very much a benefit of the doubt kind of situation. And I think Jen, who has some features of narcissism, I'm not a psychologist, <laughs> but you know, um, really exploited that. Right. But that was also, she could exploit it because people, in essence, agreed. Do you see what I'm I, saying? Absolutely, yes. You know, as I was reading this, I was thinking that one of the things that must have been hard about this, and it's also what makes it like such a complex book, um, is that, you know, you went in knowing, as you pointed out earlier, that the vast majority of, of child welfare cases involve neglect, not abuse charges, huge difference. Um, and yet it's that rare horror story that makes the news and then drives this system to continue to overreach. Yeah. And so here you are with this book trying to expose that system and at the same time, you're also grappling with the facts of abuse in this case. Yeah. And it's like, it's got to have been difficult. I mean. Yeah. I think, um, and so back to sort of abolition, right? Yeah. Um, when I was trying to get my head around this, because like abuse is real. It's extremely real, <laughs> right? And we see it playing out through the generations, um, across all income levels, right? Like we know that it exists uh, in every facet of society, but we only see CPS focus on poor people <laughs> or people who are marginalized for some reason. So black people, indigenous people, people with disabilities, people um, whose immigration status makes them very vulnerable. So the idea is like abuse is real and kids deserve to live in safety and, and be okay. But we have a system that's like ostensibly for this, but doesn't seem to really care <laughs> about how kids are doing. Like, and the kids that are in their care, like state government care, they can't, you know, in Texas, I learned this, that there was two, up until 2017, there were two definitions of abuse, of child abuse. One was for kids in biological homes, in their family homes, and there was a separate, less stringent definition for kids who were in foster care. Oh my gosh. Is that in your book? I must have, I'm, 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 it's I mean, in there. There's so many John dropping things <laughs> in this book, but. But you know, um, that's because they were getting a hard time for the, particularly these institutional settings, which are just totally rife with abuse because they're essentially like, it's like lab created to be an abusive situation. Um, people who, are, don't, who aren't well-trained or well-paid right. and kids with a serious trauma, you know? Um, and it's, it, it just became very obvious to me the more I learned about the system that what we have is really not, we're like really focused on punishing parents to the, to the peril of their own children, the kids that we're ostensibly trying to protect. Can we talk a little bit about, I, th I thought the structure of this book is, was really um, so beautifully done and it, it's, in, it's structured in two parts. And in the first part, you get to the end of the first part and you think, okay, that we've covered now what is known about the case. And I wonder what part two will bring. And part two takes everything that we learned in part one and it focuses in much more deeply and you enter into the story. So can we talk a little bit about your decision to, well, your role in the story and then the decision making around how to write about your role and what you brought in terms of your own history into this story also just because you had mentioned earlier um, that you know, that it's poor kids that uh, they grow up with the trauma of CPS. And I think in your epilogue you wrote about how you never had to worry about that. So I'd yeah. love to just hear more about your own role. Yeah, I, um, the part one and part two thing was like a, 
like an epiphany, right? Because I was struggling so much with how to tell the story in a way that would, where I was not the focus, because that's like a real um, thing you don't want to do. <laughs> Like, the, I think people avoid being in the story at all because of that. Like, you don't want it to be, um, you don't want to take the focus away from the people that it's about. Um, but in the course of reporting, there were several things that I needed to just explain. So um, the second birth family, I, uh, I found them and I told them what happened. And no one, they didn't know. And that was six months after the crash. So it had been a big national news story. You this is also just another moment in the book, which if you could just recount that. If you, it was so moving, but it just shocking. Yeah, I, um, I wasn't expecting that to be the case. I, uh, there was like a, a bunch of records that the Washington sheriff released and there was a, a family name in there that I thought, okay, that might be some because they didn't know this second birth family. And the thing about Texas is they obviously have this information, but they refused to share it even with the law enforcement that was investigating the murder. So they were kind of stumped. I mean, I did get the name from their own records, so <laughs> they had access to it. <laughs> um, I saw the, the family name and I kind of looked people up on Facebook and I reached out and I got the grandma and um, I said like do you know Marcus and Hannah and Abigail and she said yes those are my grandchildren um, and I realized that she didn't know so I called her and um, told her and it was really awful uh, you know um, I think there's a thing in, especially in breaking news reporting, where this is like a yes, fear, yes. right? Like that this might happen. Um, at that point, it was six months had passed. And so I felt like they very much needed to know. And the um, they actually needed Tammy, who was the birth mom, to submit her DNA because um, they had found some remains that they thought might be Hannah, but they couldn't be sure. So... Uh, Tammy immediately submitted her DNA, and uh, it was a match. And before they spoke with Tammy, they released a press release. And this was a big national case, just saying, um, we found it's Hannah, right? But they didn't tell her mom first. And that was so, it was so like witnessing how Tammy and her family were treated was very radicalizing for me, I think, because it was like, it shouldn't, you shouldn't need someone to tell you that the mom of a murder victim would want to know first, <laughs> like, if we found out for sure that it was her kid, you know? That's such a very, like, obvious thing, but they consistently the birth families were treated as if not only they didn't have a right to know, but that they wouldn't even be like interested in it. Yeah. And so going back to you for a moment, so you, you become a part of the story and what did that make you um, think about uh, in terms of journalism and how we're trained to think traditionally about our roles? I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, so you know, once that happened with the reporting, I felt like that was important to be, well, that that was part of the story and that Tammy's treatment was part of the story. And I couldn't figure out, like, it seemed like I was doing, trying to, like, how would I do that without putting myself in there? It felt a little bit, like, almost, like, obfuscating, right? Um, like, there's just a transparency piece. So my idea with coming up with the like part two would be that I wouldn't be where I didn't need to be. <laughs> but I could be in the place where I could really add some like context. Um, because I do think that, that their treatment in the like present day was so much a piece of like, again, it was radicalizing for me and I felt like it's important for people to hear that part of it because it was so you know, 
it made it so clear. And like, as we were saying, the women got a, the benefit of the doubt, like through out, even after the murders, like people were bending over backwards to say they must have been overwhelmed and it was pressures, not necessarily negative pressures. <laughs> you know, like the Thelma and Louise, like that was the sheriff who said that this was a Thelma and Louise situation. Like there's six children in the car. So that's not at all like Thelma and Louise. <laughs> like that, that's not, that's a, not a, a relevant, um, it gives into almost like Jen, Jen's own like self mythologizing. I felt that a lot of the reporting actually ended up doing some of that same work for her. Right. And I see the, the dean getting up, and maybe we are going to be opening up for questions. Up for oh my gosh. But as, we, so fast. as we open up for questions, I want to just, because we're in a place of journalism here, in a, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, a place of study, I, I'm curious just for any final thoughts about what you think of the state of reporting on this issue. Mm. I, I might be giving this away, but Matt Desmond shared with me that one of the really powerful things you said to him recently was that it's like this is no one's beat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is yeah. that? I, I, um, I very much felt that in the course of my reporting on this book, and I was also doing other child welfare stories in that five years and trying to really understand like various aspects of the system. And I just, um, it struck me that there is no real, I mean, we all know that there's challenges in newsrooms everywhere, but child welfare is a really important beat and it touches on so many different things. <laughs> like um, there's a huge overlap, for instance, with the criminal legal system. Um, we have a lot of data <laughs> that shows that. And I once you have your like antenna tuned in, you can see it. It's everywhere. Um, obviously, juvenile justice, immigration is a huge one. Um, it's a story of race as well. Yeah. Oh God. Deeply, and this deeply book is racist, oh deeply God. racist system. Yeah. Um, and something I really loved about the opportunity that I had with this particular book was that there was just no way to get around the racism. Yep. You know, because people do, they go to great lengths to say that it's institutional because of increased poverty rates and like we see the data, but we can like explain the data. And this was like, yes, all of that and Here's how these black people were treated, and here's how these white people were treated, and these were what they were doing when they were being treated that way. You know, it's so stark. Right. Great. So, um, anybody who has questions, you can see uh, Jen on this side or Rachel on on this side. We definitely want to get you on the mic so it gets recorded. Here's one right now. To start. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Karen Moline. I'm a founding board member of an activist group called People for Ethical Adoption Reform. And I was saying to her, you know, how grateful all of us in the adoption corruption community are for this astonishingly wonderful and painful book. Um, all of us that I've been working with for 22 years knew the minute that this accident happened that it was murder. We, we knew because I can tell you off the top of my head of at least 50 adoptees who've been murdered by their parents some of them within a week or a month of being homed in the United States. So my question is, how can you as journalists um, address these topics, like as you just said, which is an underground thing? You know, we know of these. There are websites that I can point you to that track these stories that are just updated every week. Mm -hmm. But how can we as journalists and as ethical people try to upend the savior mentality in the adoption business, because that is what's driving these stories. Yeah. If the white women were the saviors of these children, even though they killed them. So yeah. we have to take our prejudices and our lack of knowledge of what the adoption business actually is, which is savior driven, 95% white Christian, um, savior driven mm -hmm. and we have to tackle that and confront these people and and 
try to force some kind of social change because people just don't want to believe that this nice white people ha are starving their children yeah. and are beating them and do it. We don't want to believe it, but it's happening every day. Yeah. I so think that, that's my question is to journalists, how can, you know, the digging, and I, I tweeted people all the time, we all do, we've been tracking this for many years, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I just want to put it out there that there is an underground of information that is findable if you if you look for it, yeah. and that you have to force people to upend their natural inclination to believe the best yeah. when the worst is happening right in front of them. Yeah, I think um, a major goal that I had with this book is um, to show the the parts of the story in the in the adoption triad that you don't typically hear from. So we hear a lot of adoption stories. Uh, from the point of view of the adoptive parents and almost exclusively. And there's a lot of problems with that because uh, first of all, they're like the people with the most power in the triad. And um, I guess my lens as a reporter has always been to interrogate the power dynamics. And I think we are seeing a lot of of reporting that's like really good reporting about the child welfare system. I feel like in the past couple of years that have been really hard hitting like investigative stuff that is looking at the system as a system of power. Um, but I think it's also sort of changing the narrative to center different voices than we ever hear. Because if we only ever hear that one narrative and again, like that's the Je that's Jen Hart's narrative, and that's why people all followed her on social media <laughs> because it's like it, she she didn't make that up, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and so I feel like that the frustrating part as a reporter was seeing that all of the like complexity and the systemic critique was being sort of stripped out of the story um, because you know. It invisibilized the birth families, which I felt was really um, not not okay. But it also like took the accountability away from the systems. And you know, these women are dead now, so there's no one. You know, they're like, who do you, who should be accountable? And I think like clearly, there are states who in, were entrusted with the care of these kids that should be accountable to them and to what happened to them. Hi, uh, my name is Jay. I'm actually a former CPS investigator myself and uh, the founder of a consulting firm, CPS Protect Consulting Services, that now actually helps families prepare for and navigate CPS cases. Um, congratulations on surviving, going as far down the rabbit hole as you have. It is certainly an emotionally taxing uh, adventure, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. My question is, in a free society, people have the freedom to do good and the freedom to do evil. At the same time, free will does not mean freedom from consequence. Keeping this in mind and everything you have learned covering the child welfare industry, how do we solve the problem that is child welfare today? while maintaining a free society? Okay, that's a good question. I um, I think part of, you know, what I tried to do in the epilogue with abolition was make it a little more legible to people who, for whom it seems really out there. <laughs> like, why, what would happen with these kids? They need, you know, they're still being harmed. People need to protect them, right? Um, and that's true. I think there are kids definitely in need of protection all over the place. Um, I think the first and foremost thing is that there's like a lot of steps to get to a place where you wouldn't, you know, and, and the steps are sort of like, a harm reduction model. Um, I think there's just a, there's way too many kids who are being removed for situations that that's not benefiting them, right? That they maybe need some help, 
but taking them out of their homes and out of their communities and out of their classrooms with the teacher that checks on them. And like the communities are really important. And, you know, you brought up like, I've never, I, I had a like an unstable childhood. And that was, I think similar to a lot of people's experience. I don't think I'm unique there. I think, um, Mary Carr once said the definition of a dysfunctional family is any family containing more than one member. <laughs> when she had quite a childhood too. <laughs> um, I, but like the thing was, is that the, the uh, things, the things that allowed me to be a resilient kid were in my community and with my best friends and like their imperfect parents that we sort of like the amalgamation of all of these parents <laughs> somehow did a little bit of what we needed. Um, and, you know, like it's challenging and you, you grow up and you work through the stuff that happened to you, right? But like the intervention of the state there, I think should really be like used only in the most dire of situations because we don't have good places for these kids to go and we can't take care of them when they're in government care and that should be you know we're removing kids for things where they're still having love in their family and feeling love right and we're taking them from that and all of the other things that could help make them resilient and we're putting them in a place with strangers who aren't always kind and where we know abuse is more prevalent like what are we doing for those kids? You know, I think we have a lot that we can do for kids outside of a punitive system that would meaningfully increase their odds for getting out of the places that they need to get out of. I think one of the things that you uh, show so powerfully in this book is the need not to protect children, but to protect families. And I do wonder if there needs to be kind of a reframing of, of these issues in terms of a policy approach that treats the family as this sort of central asset in which to invest, yeah. um, as dysfunctional as it may be, because nothing is worse than the trauma that comes from parent-child separation, and we know this. Yeah, we have a lot of research, right? Like, And it's actually in the child welfare best practices at this point, right, that kids should stay with their families, if at all possible, with their parents, and if not with their parents, with their family members. Um, but we see day after day in the courts this not playing out. I mean, even with the, you know, Texas, they pay kinship caregivers now monthly, but they pay them less than half of what they pay foster parents. So, like, we're talking about we're saying in what you know out of one side of our mouth that we know kids do best with their families and then we're saying but here's where our money is going and it's not to the families <laughs> there's a, there's a disconnect there that like i think kind of shows that there is a preference and that the preference is not uh reunification right we have one more question over here Thank you both for being here. It's such a pleasure to hear you speak, and it also excites me that you guys have been talking to Matthew Desmond, who to me is like the cool journalist club. Um, <laughs> I'm a CUNY J School alum, and I'm now a producer at MSNBC. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to a publication that does cover child welfare full time. It's called The Imprint. And I am really proud to have worked with them and that they've kept the spotlight on this issue from a journalist system point. Uh, but also, I'm really looking forward to the work that you'll be doing, Roxana, at ProPublica, which has also done some amazing reporting on this. Um, since I cover politics, I can't help but thinking about the politicization of adoption right now and what that process has started to mean in the absence of abortion access, um, especially as the religious right uses it as a way to deny reproductive care. And I'm curious your thoughts on that um, and how that complicates the issue of you know, promoting reunification and abolition um, while you also are looking at people wanting a, quote, stream of babies. Yeah, that's a... a um, well, it's very challenging. I live in Texas, so I'm right there in the midst of the like 
uh, war against abortion. I think it's really challenging because I think, you know, the ideas that we have about people who need abortions is, does, is not always, does not always bear out in the people who actually, that we know, get them. <laughs> um, I think it's a huge challenge. I think there's a lot going on in places like Texas right now in that that's speeding up a very, um, is speeding up something that's we, we've all been seeing happening, but it's it's happening really fast in places like Texas that I think are gonna um, make things a lot harder for <laughs> all sorts of people. I think the foster youth in Texas, there's been a lawsuit for 12 years, and those kids are still not safe and still not okay. I think things will probably get worse if we res further restrict people's bodily autonomy. <laughs> So it's like it's like it's a really good question. It's sort of really bleak. <laughs> like the way I feel about it is pretty bleak because um, you know we have a lot of we've even without all of this latest surge of stuff we've had a lot of get that that stands in the way. Um, a lot of foster youth get pregnant and and become parents as as foster youth. So that's like second generation foster youth who aren't even, you know, I one time saw a court hearing involving a young woman who was in foster care who was pregnant and they like bodily autonomy is really non-existent when you're when the state is your guardian so there's a lot of really like awful things about that is this a 12 year old that's in your book that had a, well there's so many courses. yeah <laughs> yeah no I don't think I put her in the book because I actually was like waiting for Ye's case and I just saw this one happening and it was like oh my god no but it's so bad there's but Dante's child going into foster care is in the book and yeah you see that you see that across generations it's yeah so Dante uh his son was removed while I was reporting the book and um so I knew him like pretty well and um, he was a few months older than my son and I reported his entire like court case and then his um, parents lost their rights too. So that's a second generation um, system impacted kid. Great, well thank you both so much for this very insightful and informative conversation and thank you for all your work. Just a, um, a couple other quick thank yous. Um, first for our, our Dean, Graciela Maschowski, who gave full support to this event. We're so glad we were able to do this. Thank you to, to Peter and to Jen and to Rachel and to all the other folks who made it happen. And thanks most of all to all of you who came in with your time, your interest, and your questions. We really greatly appreciate it. Um, and we hope you'll be able to join us um, in the cafeteria area for some refreshments and for some book signings. So thanks, and we'll see everybody in the Thank next you. room. Thank you.